Hallelujah. Lift our hands and begin to worship the Lord tonight. Oh, praise God. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We thank you, Jesus. Uh, oh, hallelujah. 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 Lord, we bless you. Thank you that we're in your house tonight. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we've come together. Oh, Lord, hallelujah, Jesus, to worship you, to bless you, uh, to praise you, and to magnify you. Oh, God, hallelujah. We lift you up, Jesus. Uh, we give you glory, oh, God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Let's sing and worship the Lord together tonight. Amen. He's worthy to be praised. Going through, I don't care what the rest of the world decides to do. I've made up my mind, ain't gonna turn around. Walking with my Jesus, and I'm going through. Oh, well, I'm going through. I'm going through. I don't care what the rest of the world decides to do oh lord i've made up my mind ain't gonna turn around walking with my jesus and i'm going through oh i'm going through oh yes lord i'm going through i don't care what the rest of the world decides to do i've made up my mind Ain't gonna turn around I'm walking with my Jesus And I'm going through I'm going through Oh well, I'm going through I don't care what the rest of the world decides to do Oh Lord, I've made up my mind And I ain't gonna turn around walking with my Jesus and I'm going through, oh, I'm going through, my mind. ain't going to turn around, I'm walking with my Jesus and I'm going through, made up my mind, I ain't going to turn around, I'm walking with my Jesus and I'm going through, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship your great name. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody got a made up mind tonight? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Very soon. Oh, we are going to see.
Oh, we are going to see the King. Oh, yes, soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. Oh, we love you today, Jesus. We praise you today, Lord, and magnify your great name today, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for being here tonight. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, Kayla, if you could put those prayer request slides, if you've got them, amen. We have several things that we're praying about. Folks through our Facebook ad have requested prayer. I uh, had one come in just before church, a lady by the name of Rhonda, requesting prayer for herself and her two daughters. Uh, Victoria, her husband Rick has cancer. Michael, his son, Joseph has a brain tumor. Uh, pray for Melissa, for Liz. Uh, finishing up chemo, uh, Maria's children, uh, Sally's having surgery, and her friend Diane lost her significant other, uh, Angie, her brother-in-law Steve has cancer, Crystal, her children, Patty and Walt, both with kidney issues, Nicole, cancer, Greg, his uh, family and financial needs, uh, Naomi, um, continue to pray for the families that were affected by the tragic shootings in our community. Wendy's having surgery, Irma uh, for her health, our first responders, pray for Lita, and uh, there's been a couple more come in, a lady by the name of Janice, request of prayer, um, and a couple more that I haven't added to that list yet, but this lady Rhonda, uh, just before church, requesting prayer for a job and a place to live for her, uh, she and her two daughters, and so while these names just kind of scroll uh, over the next couple of moments, let's take these needs to the Lord in prayer tonight. Lift them up to the Lord. God knows their name, their circumstance, where they live, what their need is. Tonight, let's pray in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you. Father, we are so thankful, oh God, that you're a God who can meet every need uh, according, oh Lord, hallelujah, to your riches and glory. We're thankful, Lord, God, that you're our healer. We're thankful, oh God, that you're a provider. Lord, we pray for these that are sick, Lord Jesus, uh, these that have kidney issues, cancer issues. Uh, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you right now that you will touch them uh, by your mighty power today. Uh, they'll feel the hand of the Lord upon them. Uh, Lord, I pray for Rhonda for her needs. Oh God of housing and employment, I ask you to bless her and her family. Open the right doors, Lord, for her. Lead her, oh God, hallelujah, to the right job. Lord, work on her behalf today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, each and every one of these, Lord, have trusted us, God, to pray for them. And we want to be faithful to lift them up before you today, oh God. Lord, have thine own way, Jesus. Have thine own way, have thine own way, have thine own way. Uh, Lord, we love you, oh God. We praise you today. Uh, we magnify your great name, oh God. Uh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. We've got another song, but let me make a couple of announcements. Of course, during this next song, if you have offering, you can bring that. Um, several things in the backs of the seats in front of you there's a flyer that looks like this this is advertising our uh, family conference that's coming up uh, it is going to be open um, to ministers and families uh, it was but before things opened up it was just going to be ministers and spouses but as of today everybody said today, today. amen restrictions have been lifted mask mandates have been lifted and uh, with this happening Brother Graves was going to open this conference up to our, our pastors, ministers, and their families. It will be held at, at Christian World Fellowship. For everybody else, there's information on here. You can watch this online. And uh, I'm imagining on that Wednesday night, July the 14th, probably that service night, we will probably watch that online uh, together here at the house of the Lord. 
Amen. And so there's information on that. Um, and then also a couple of different things. Some have a, a flyer that looks like this, and some is more like a bookmark. This is our uh, Ladies Ministries, Mother's Memorial offering reminder that uh, we need to have Ladies uh, Ministries, Mother's Memorial offering in by, by the 15th. And so over the next couple of weeks, if you um, have something that you've been planning on giving to Mother's Memorial, you can get that in and we will get that sent to uh, Ladies Ministries. And Ladies Ministries helps so much. The bookmark card that's in front of you, not so much this full sheet flyer, but the one that looks like a bookmark, it has all of the different uh, causes that Mother's Memorial and Lady, <clears throat> excuse me, Ladies Ministry supports. Tupelo Children's Mansions, Lighthouse uh, Ranch for Boys, New Beginnings Adoption Agency, um, all manner of things. And so um, this is a great way to help others. And so that's coming up. I want to remind you about that. Hey, everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. We're going to sing another song. If you have an offering, you can bring it at this time. And uh, worship the Lord with us as we sing. Sing with us tonight. You should know this song. Most of you should anyway. The wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. a place when we all get to heaven. Oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We will sing and shout the victory. Worship him tonight. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we praise your great name today. Hallelujah. We praise your great name, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. My wife was practicing these songs before church. 
they're all about heaven. You know, that's wonderful. I told her, I said, I'm teaching about hell tonight. So, just kidding, I'm not. Amen. Praise God. Isn't the Lord wonderful? Amen. Amen. Praise God. It's wonder wonderful to have brother and sister Bigelow home. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Amen. You can never go on a month-long vacation again. Amen. No. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. This Sunday is July the 4th, and um, we made the decision after uh, such great feedback a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm saying that facetiously. But uh, we made the decision to not have church this Sunday. So this weekend, this would be this will be a great weekend to go camping, go to the ocean, go to the lake, get together with some people, have a picnic, and get it out of your system, and then don't ever miss church again the rest of the year. Amen. And so that's just kind of how that works. Praise God. And so this would be a great weekend to to do that and celebrate with family and with friends, and um, just have a great time. I will be gone. Uh, Grant and Elena and I are leaving on Saturday, and we'll be gone until the following Saturday. So my wife will be here, and um, so there will be church on Wednesday night. Next Wednesday night, someone doesn't know that they're preaching or teaching yet, but they are, and so thank the Lord for that. And then um, um, the following Sunday, we'll be back. And Brother Michael is going to be preaching on that Sunday, the 11th. And so uh, you don't want to miss that. You want to be here. That's why you're going to go out of town this weekend, so you can be here next weekend. Amen. With the mask mandate and, and that threshold of just about 70% vaccination rate, not quite. Amen. Of course, the church has been wide open, but anybody that has, uh, that's holding back that maybe you're watching, amen, come on back. Amen. There's a Macedonian call saying, come back to church. Amen. And so um, I don't want to have to be like the Lord. And Revelation 3 said that, uh, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Amen. I'm going to have to go to some folks' home and stand at the door and knock and say, hello, come on back to church. Amen. Everybody say, back to church. Praise God. I'm glad that you're here on this Wednesday night. And a couple of weeks ago, we started a series on the, uh, the armor, the whole armor, and we're going to continue that tonight. We're, we won't finish tonight, but we're going to continue that. And so uh, this evening, I want to direct your attention to the Word of the Lord, to the book of Ephesians. I know most of you here, you've probably heard a million uh, sermons on the armor, but it's been a while since we had taught about it, and so we wanted to bring that to you. Ephesians chapter number 6 and seven, verse number 17 will be our uh, verse that we're focusing on tonight, and just the beginning portion of that, and I'm not going to take a long time to recap the other lessons of the last two weeks. But Ephesians 6 and 17 says, and take the helmet of salvation. Everybody said take. What I'm finding with this armor, first of all, whole armor is emphasized. That means if you're missing the helmet or the breastplate or the sandals, you are insufficiently uh, armored. You're not adequately protected. So we've got to take the whole armor. But over and over, it encourages us or teaches us or commands us, take. You know, above all, take the shield of faith. And then take the helmet. So we have some responsibility in this. The Lord provides this armor for us, but we have responsibility to make sure that we are adequately equipped. the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the Lord. So take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
So Kayla, I want to go to those slides tonight. We're going to talk to you about the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Helmets are still a big part of our world today in many, uh, whether they're sports or occupations, a helmet is required. Let's go to the next slide. See, our firefighters wear a helmet. Go to the next one. Construction workers wear protection on their head. They wear a hard hat. Motorcycle riders, well, not all of them, but uh, wear helmet. You know, I've never been able to figure out in my life why, I mean, I'm for wearing a seatbelt in the car. I'm for that. But why in some places, you know, you have to, it's the law that you're strapped in a seatbelt in the car, but the guy on a motorcycle can take off without a helmet. I've never figured that out. Anyway, motorcycle helmet. Anybody know what helmet that is? Brother Kurt's not here tonight, but anybody know what kind of helmet that is? Welders, they wear protection. Football players wear a helmet. Baseball players wear helmets. And oh, go back just a second. So baseball, it, you know, they've evolved. All these helmets have evolved, but uh, that's one that has flaps over both ears. Back in the day, it was only uh, the ear that, uh, was, you know, like facing the pitcher. A lot of them just had a single ear flap. Go ahead. What kind of helmet is that? Bicycle riders are encouraged to wear a helmet. What kind of helmet is that? Huh? A jockey. Jockeys. I'm not sure how much that little silk, I don't know if there's anything underneath that silk there. It's got to be something little hard, but anyways, jockeys riding horses. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess tonight, I, that was going to be what someone would guess they did, hockey. It's very similar, and it could probably be used as, hockey players could probably use that. Huh? No, they could probably use that, though. Anybody else want to guess? Huh? Polo? No. No. Close. I'm so glad I put this one in here. That right there is a bull rider's helmet. Bull riders have gotten to wear, uh, some of them will still wear just plain old cowboy hats, but a lot of bull riders will now wear a helmet that looks like that. Bull riders. What's next? And then, of course, that represents uh, military, our armed forces, all when they uh, go into battle. They're wearing some kind of protection on their head. And so, this right here would be the helmet. Um, and it, I'm sure it's evolved a little bit, but this was a, a Roman helmet a helmet worn by soldiers in the Roman army. And you can see in this, and there, there was different, different ones, uh, but it had not only protection for the, the top of the head, but it has both of the ears protected down to the jaw line. And then even in the back, it would come down and it would cover like the back of the neck. And, um, and then they didn't necessarily always wear that plume, that Plume could be maybe to signify rank or some formal occasion, um, or it could even signify like a regiment that they uh, were a part of. But this was a very vital piece of their armor. Let's go to the next slide. And so we're going to talk tonight a little bit about the helmet of salvation. But in doing that, I want to bring something else to your attention. Let's hit the next one. There is a condition or a disease 
now that's being studied more and more. We're learning more and more about it. But it is called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. For short, it's CTE. Now obviously, I've got the definition of what it is on here, but it is CTE is the term used to describe brain degeneration, which is likely caused by repeated head trauma. CTE is a diagnosis made only at autopsy by studying the sections of the brain. In other words, you don't know. You may have some signs, but they cannot definitively determine if you have CTE until after it's too late, until you're dead. But the way that you get CTE is through repeated head trauma. That's why football players, they're, they're doing more and more in the game of football to uh, better technology in their helmets. But they're trying to get them, when they tackle someone, not to lead with their head. In other words, they can't just spear somebody with their head anymore. Okay, that They've got to turn their head aside. Do, or hit them in the shoulder. They can't, they can't lead with their head. They get a penalty. Get maybe perhaps even kicked out of the game if you do that too many times. Because what is happening as they study, especially in the game of football, there are these players who, you know, they retire at an early age. And then as, you know, they get into their 30s and 40s, they begin to develop all of these different types of symptoms. They, you know, have memory loss. They're very, they're depressed. Um, all these different things. And there have been uh, several different, especially football players, that have taken their own life because the degeneration of the brain, the injuries to the brain that's caused by this repeated trauma can cause someone to feel suicidal. And so there are those players or retired players that have, uh, that, that have taken their own lives. And so even like the boxer, Sugar Ray Leonard, his... His, uh, his brain was not autopsied, uh, and we didn't know as much about it back then, but it is su suspected that uh, you know, boxers like Sugar Ray Leonard uh, more than likely had this CTE. You even think about it, and I'll show you something here, here in a moment, but um, even Muhammad Ali, one of the you know, greatest boxers of all times, but yet in, uh, before he passed away, he had uh, Parkinson's. And so, you know, where, where you know, he, would, he would shake and, and couldn't control, like, movements. That's one of the, the uh, fact, the long-term uh, side effects or factors that result from CTE. And so, it's important. You can see why protecting the head is important. Because right here, I mean, just cover, underneath this hard skull that we have you know, is the, the nervous center of our body, the control of our body, where, our, where not just our movements and our speech and all of that, but it's, it's the command center where it, it directs everything that happens in the body. And so if you continually traumatize this very vital organ, you can see how not only then does it affect just that organ, but if, if you get hit often enough in that area where uh, that controls speech, you can see long term you're going to lose the ability to speak or some of your movements and things like this. And so uh, this, it's a very dangerous condition. And now then there are some, not all, but there are some, you know, uh, guys that have played football and they're, they're saying, you know, I don't want my boys, I don't want my sons to play the game. I don't want them to have to deal with what I've had to deal with. And, and I, I think about even my growing up, you know, I mean, I didn't play organized sports and whatever, but we, I mean, we played in the street without pads and helmets and we played tackle football in the field down at the end of the, I mean, and uh, I mean, we, we played just like we thought we were in the NFL, you know, and so uh, I, I, I can't tell you that I've had a concussion, but uh, who knows what would happen if after I die, they look at my brain, what they would find. Probably not much, uh, as in not much there. And so, um, but uh, it's a very dangerous thing. Let's go to the next slide. CTE has been found in the brains of people who play football and other contact sports, including boxing. I mentioned that. It may also occur in military personnel who were exposed to explosive blasts. 
You think about that. Back like in World War II, and some of these different, before we had all this, these scientific advancements, you know, guys would see, uh, hear and see bombs fall, and, and they would, you know, that when they came back, especially from World War II, if their personality was changed or they were different, what, what did we call it back then? Huh? Shell shock. Right. They were just shell shocked. Now then, we have a different name for it. We call it post-traumatic stress disorder. But these military uh, personnel who are exposed to that type of environment, they can develop CTE. And so here's, here's why it's dangerous. Because CTE, some of the signs and symptoms of it, thought to include difficulties with thinking. You say, I'm just kind of in a fog. I just can't think right. Uh, emotions out of whack. Okay. Physical problems and behaviors that then develop. Maybe violent behaviors or just acting out type behaviors. All of these things are a result of the brain being repeatedly traumatized. And, and so you can see today why it's important that as Christians that we have some sort of helmet, some sort of protection something because I'm going to approach it from the angle tonight that our when we're talking about this helmet of salvation it covers our mind and when we come to the Lord we're a new creature in Christ Jesus and so we've got a new mind and over and over in the scripture I'm going to get to some of those tonight we're, we're told to let our mind be renewed let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus and so if it has to deal with our thinking you can see then why the enemy would attack your thinking and would attack your emotions. And so the Lord has given us something to protect our thinking and something to protect our emotions. Uh, something to protect us uh, so that we don't have to have wrong thinking or as someone would say, stinking thinking. And so this helmet tonight is very important uh, because the enemy wants you to think wrong thoughts and the enemy wants you to feel wrong feelings uh, and he, he wants you to feel bitterness about things he wants you to feel rage and uncontrolled anger he, the, the enemy wants you to think that nobody loves you the enemy wants you to think that you're not saved the enemy wants you to think that you, you have no hope and you have no future the enemy wants you to think that there's nothing to this word of God and the enemy wants to question uh, everything about your experience uh, and so the only way that we can combat that is that we have the helmet of salvation Got to have it. Let's go to the next slide, please. CTE, it, the, the cognitive impairment that it causes, difficulty thinking, memory loss, problems with planning and organization and carrying out tax, tasks, executing uh, functions, just different daily functions of life. So difficulty thinking. I'm going to tell you what. The Lord gives us His Word so we can think right. Hello? Amen. I need you to help me out tonight, okay? The Lord gives us His Word. He gives us His Spirit. He gives us preaching and teaching to help us with our thinking. Memory loss. You know, through the Old Testament, especially when they were the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness and coming out of that experience, they were told over and over, remember, 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 remember. So one of the tricks of the enemy is to get you to forget what the Lord has done for you. Forget the blessings. Forget the miracles. Forget the great things. He, just, he wants to cloud your mind with, with doubt. Behavioral changes, impulsive behavior, aggressive behavior. I mean, we can make a spiritual application. Somebody's living for God, then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, they're gung ho, they're excited, they're on fire. And then all of a sudden, we don't see them. All of a sudden, other things now become more important. All of a sudden, you know, when I was growing up, I'm just going to say stuff tonight. I'll probably make people mad, get me in trouble, but 
Uh, I live that way anyway. But you know, when I was growing up, and we live in a different world now. I mean, it's more of a 24-7 world, and I understand that. But like when I was growing up, it was like when you go to get a job, you know, it was like our pastor and parents were like, don't you get a job that you got to work on Wednesday nights. You need to be at church on Wednesday nights. That's how I was raised. See, church needs to be our reason to miss other things. Other things don't need to be our reason to miss church. See, we didn't, we didn't play competitive sports. And I, maybe there's people listening tonight that, that won't understand this. And I'm here I am. But it was, hey, the practices are on church nights. The games are on youth nights. And so you need to be at church. That's just how I was raised. And we've lived, we live now in a world where the priority is, has shifted. I mean, literally, I was raised, and I know some of you will remember this. I remember what we called the blue laws or whatever, where, where stuff was closed on Sundays so you could go to church. I remember one of the uh, places to eat that my grandparents, they, it was a cafeteria. It was called Piccadilly Cafeteria. Anybody ever been to a Piccadilly Cafeteria? <laughs> it was in the mall. And it was so weird to go there with my grandparents on Sunday after church. That's what they like to do. Because, you know, every other thing in the mall was closed, but the cafeteria was open. You know, that's where we'd go eat. Anybody remember those days? See? I'm as old as Brother Bigelow and John. We're the only two that remember them. Amen. I mean, I, my parents, they didn't let us stay home. If we had homework, you bring it with you. Or you stay up late after you get home, do it. That's just how I was raised. But our world has changed now. But when you begin to see spiritual behavioral changes in people, It's not for us to judge and point a finger. It's not for us to pray because, see, that helmet of salvation, somewhere along the right, it's either got loose or they've taken it off and set aside and there's some kind of stinking thinking that's getting into their mind and spirit. I'm, tra I'm treading where angels fear to tread tonight. Is that all right? Is this all right? What I'm talking about is we need to get back. I know we can't go back 50 years and turn the, the, the clock back and all that stuff, but we at least need to get back to where the things of God are a priority. And not just whether or not it's convenient. Let's go to the next slide. CTE can cause you to have mood disorders, depression, apathy, emotional instability, substance misuse or abuse, suicidal thoughts and behavior. All this because somebody got hit too many times in the head. Can anybody see the spiritual application that I'm really trying to make tonight? How important our salvation is to us and why the enemy tries to attack it so hard. The enemy wants you depressed and apathetic. Come on. Are we looking around? Do we see, unfortunately, do we see Christians that are apathetic about their faith and about the things of God? Oh, God, help us to put the helmet of salvation on. Depression is a very real thing. I'm not minim minimizing that. But one, one thing that the Lord's given us to help us with that is this helmet of salvation. Look around. We see people that are unstable in so many ways. Emotionally unstable people. Oh, they need the helmet of salvation. People that are struggling with substance abuse or misuse. They need the helmet of salvation. People that are struggling with thoughts of taking their own life, uh, they need the helmet of salvation. You, you believe that tonight? 
See, the enemy is after your head. He's after your mind. He's after your thinking. He's after your behavior. The, the enemy, he doesn't care if you're depressed, unstable, uh, 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 abused, or abusing substances, or if you're suicidal. He just does not want you to have on that helmet of salvation. It can lead long term to Parkinson's and motor neuron disease. Too many blows in the head. I'm going to tell you what, this is why we need the Word of God. We need the house of God. We need the people of God. We need the presence of God. We need the church. Uh, we need to be together. Uh, amen. Uh, because this is our refreshing. This is our renewing. This is our encouragement. This is where we can polish up the armor. This is where we can make sure it fits right. We've got it on tight. Uh, this is where that happens. Anybody believe that tonight? The long-term things, Parkinson's and motor neurons. See, you can look down the road at people who walk away from the things of God and, and see things in their life that have developed. And you just wonder if they had stayed in the faith, if they had stayed with the church, if they had stayed in the book, if they had stayed on their knees in prayer, would their life be different? I believe it would be. Do I have another slide? Look at this. This is a cross section of uh, brains that have been autopsied. The one, uh, the larger, lighter colored one, that's a normal brain. The other one, is a brain that has experienced advanced CTE. You see the difference in size? You see the areas on the smaller one, the CTE brain, that part, where, where, where basically parts of the brain are missing? See, this is the trauma of taking too many blows to the head. See, this is a spiritual analogy of what the enemy of your soul wants to do to you. He wants to beat you uh, with the things of the world, with worldliness, with carnality, with all these things. Just hit you upside the I mean, come on. He wants to hit you upside the head with it at every opportunity that he has. You and I, we need a helmet of salvation. What's my next slide? This slide shows two different brains. The one on the left is a healthy and normal sized brain. And the one on, uh, did I say left? Yeah. The one on the other side, it's smaller and discolored. Okay. You can see why it's important that we have a helmet of salvation. Next slide. The helmet of salvation. I'll probably not get to all of these scriptures this evening, but the helmet of salvation is mentioned also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 8. <clears throat> and it says this, if you have that one, Kayla, 1 Thessalonians, thank you. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breast breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation Paul ties hope to our salvation this is what salvation brings to us salvation brings hope and so what the enemy is attacking, when he's attacking your salvation, he's really attacking your hope. Because when we're saved, when we're delivered, when we're free from sin, when our sins are washed away, and we realize we don't have to pay the penalty of sins, that Jesus paid it for us, that causes hope to spring up in us. And so the enemy wants to rob us of our hope. We have to understand this evening that, that Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, he talks about the tricks, the wiles, the schemes, the devices of the enemy that attack the mind of the believer. 
in Romans chapter 8, verse number 6. I've got to go through these kind of quickly, but Romans chapter 8, verse number 6, it says to be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded is death. See, the enemy, he doesn't want you to be spiritually minded. He doesn't want you to have hope. He doesn't want you to think on good things. And so this earthly, natural, carnal mind, it's in opposition to the things of the Spirit. In fact, Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul goes on to say, to say that the carnal mind is enmity with Christ. But all through the New Testament, through the epistles, Paul talks about our mind being renewed. Let's look at Romans 12 and 2. Most of you could quote this verse. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, our carnal mind is enmity with God. Our carnal mind will lead to spiritual death. Our carnal mind is in opposition to God. And so that mind has to be renewed. And the way that that mind is renewed is that we are filled with the Spirit. The the way that that mind is renewed is that we are continually washed by the water of the Word. Let me just say this. If you do not have a steady diet and intake of the Word of God, you will have a carnal mind. No if ands, or buts about it. No way to escape it. No way around it. But we've got to allow our minds to be re- renewed. And we are renewed by the Spirit. I, I love that passage in Jude. I, I used it last week as well, talking about faith. But it talks about building up yourselves in your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. And so there ought to be times when you pray In the Spirit. And let me just say this, and for everybody watching online or anybody watching online, when I'm talking about praying in the Spirit, I am talking about praying with other tongues or in other tongues. It ought to happen in our lives because that's whenever our brain is in neutral. Sister Sandy put some stuff on this on our Landmark Church Facebook page, our members only. You go back through there, she put some good stuff on there. And talks about how that the, the actual speech center of the mind is disengaged whenever somebody is speaking in tongues. And so literally, it is miraculous and the Spirit of God is flowing through you. And things are being accomplished in the Spirit that you can never accomplish in your flesh. And this is where our mind is re- renewed. When we're in the Word of God. When we're praying in the Spirit. Can I get an amen out there? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2 and 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This, this is the goal of the Christian, or, or the, what, what Christ desires for us is that we have his mind, his thinking. His will, His purpose, His desires. Well, how do I know the mind of Christ? Right here. We have the mind of Christ. Ephesians 4, 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Philippians 2 and 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he goes on in the following verses to talk about what that mindset was. That, that, that the Lord, He humbled Himself and He became a servant. He became obedient even unto death. But it was this mindset of, of, of humility and servanthood. He said, let this mind be in you. Look at Hebrews chapter number 8 and verse number 10. The writer of Hebrews quoting an Old Testament writer but said, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. I'll write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. 
See, God writes His laws in our mind when we spend time in prayer, when we spend time in the Word of God, when we spend time in the presence of God, when we spend time listening to the preaching and gathering with the saints of God. Amen. He writes His laws into our mind and into our heart. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 13. He says, wherefore, gird up. Again, this is your responsibility. Gird up, shore up uh, the, the loins of your mind. It's not anybody else's fault. It's not anybody else's responsibility. If I'm going to be saved, uh, if I'm going to have the mind of Christ, uh, I've got to gird up the loins of my mind. I've got to take ownership of my walk with the Lord. In fact, in Philippians 4, verse 8, you know this verse. Paul said it. What, what are you supposed to think about? Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest. That's a long verse for... Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. Here's what we're supposed to be thinking about. Things that are true, things that are honest, things that are just things that are pure, things that are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. So here's what I have to ask myself. Are the things that I'm watching, are the things that I'm listening to, are the things that I'm reading, is the music that I'm, I'm listening to, is it true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report? That's what I'm supposed to be putting in my mind. Whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. This mind. And it's that mindset of the true, the honest, the good, the just, the pure, the lovely, the things that are good. That mindset is under attack today. Do you believe that? From all sectors of society. Back in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8, Paul talked about this helmet of salvation. He said, which is the hope. When we think about salvation, it's kind of interesting. There's Some writers say that there's three tenses. The past, the present, and the future tense of salvation. The past tense would be illustrated by uh, Titus 3 and 5. Did I give that verse to you? I didn't have it highlighted, but I had, there we go. Thank you. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Saved us is past tense. Okay? That speaks of our conversion experience. When we felt conviction for our sins. When we found a place to pray and to repent and cry out to God. Okay? That, that conversion experience. When we were baptized in the name of Jesus and our sins were washed away and we were filled with the, the glorious gift of the Holy Ghost. That heavenly language flowed out through us. Paul told Titus, that's according to the mercy of God. But some, some of us, that's really all that we have sometimes as we look back to that past experience. I wonder how many of us, I hope all of you, but do you remember the day that you got the Holy Ghost, the day that you got baptized? I don't remember the day I got baptized. I don't have any record of it. I didn't get a certificate. I was very young. But I remember being baptized. But I do remember it was on November the 3rd, 1978, when I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank the Lord for that past tense. According to His mercy, He saved me. The present tense of salvation is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse uh, number 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved right now in the present. It's the power of God. So we have this present tense of our salvation. Let's look at one more in the present. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved. Again, in the present tense. 
And then our salvation also has a future tense. Romans 13, 11. Uh, now is our salvation nearer than we believe. That's Romans 13, 11. Now, he's talking about wake up out of sleep. Behold, it's the day of salvation. And he says, now is our salvation nearer. What's he talking about? If, if I've already been saved in the past, I had a conversion experience. When he says, now is my salvation nearer, what's he talking about? Well, we'll get there in a moment. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9 also deals with the future tense of our salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9. To obtain, part of the verse says, to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So, and obtaining, in other words, I don't have it already, but it's a salvation that I'm going to obtain. What's he talking about? So let me cover this quickly. I know I'm bumping up against 8 o'clock. The conversion, that's the past tense. That's the new birth experience. The present salvation, that's this state of persevering. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Present tense salvation is my responsibility, my ongoing responsibility to crucify the flesh every day. Present tense salvation is my daily walk and my daily journey of faith with the Lord. Present tense salvation is daily running the race. Present tense salvation is daily fighting the good fight of Faith. The daily things. Paul said, I die daily. Right? Daily. I know it's a lot of information. So we've got the past, which is conversion. We're still talking about the helmet of salvation. We've got the present, which is perseverance, enduring unto the end. But we've got the future tense of salvation. That salvation yet to be obtained, yet to be revealed. That salvation, that part of our salvation is hope. That's what we're hoping for. Right? And this right here is what's under attack. The enemy can't argue with your experience in the past. You had a conversion experience. And you got it marked down. You know that you know that you know something happened to you and your life was forever different. Your daily walk with God, other people see it. You know, you've got daily spiritual disciplines of prayer and, and, and weekly things, maybe of fasting and reading the Word of God and all these types of things. That perseverance, that enduring, that being responsible uh, you know, to crucify the flesh. But what the enemy wants to attack to a great degree is the hope that you have. And it says this salvation, he compared it to the hope. This is a, a salvation that is yet to be revealed. Now, I'm not going to read these verses because there's too many in the passage, but, but the idea for the next few statements comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 all the way through 54. Some scholars call this the resurrection, resurrection chapter. And it outlines our hope that is yet to be revealed, that is yet to be obtained. And this is what the devil is after. That hope when the kingdom of God is delivered up. That hope that we have when Jesus puts down all rule, all authority, and all power. The hope that we have when Jesus puts all things under His feet. When the last trumpet sounds. When the dead shall be raised incorruptible. When we shall all be changed. When corruption puts on incorruption. And mortal puts on immortality. When death is swallowed up in victory. When sin is banished forever. And when the body is forever redeemed. That's our hope that we have. Is anybody, is that your hope? I mean if not, why in the world are we here? That's the day that we're looking forward to. And people can scoff and say, oh, they've been preaching about the coming of the Lord for the last 80 years, you know, blah, 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 whatever. But you know what? I have hope today. 
I don't know when He's coming, but I know He is coming. And I know the Word of God declares that one day, the, I, I, I've been delivered right now from the penalty of sin. Amen. But one day, I will be delivered from the power and the presence of sin uh, because I will have a glorified body and be with Him forever in, in heaven. That's the hope that I have. And that's what we keep pushing for and keep preaching about and keep striving for and keep reaching for. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 further defines that hope. When the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise, then we which are alive and remain shall rise together to meet them in the, Lord, to meet them in the air uh, with the Lord, and, and we are caught up together with them in the clouds uh, where we are ever with the Lord. Is anybody listening for a trumpet today? Uh, is anybody waiting on the day when the dead in Christ shall rise and we will arise with them? That's the hope that we have. But you see, through our minds, through our thoughts, through our emotions, the enemy wants to attack that hope that we have. Oh, it hasn't happened in the last 80 years. It hasn't happened, you know, Where's your God when this happened? With blah, 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 all this stuff in your family, all this pandemic, all this, all that, whatever. The enemy wants to attack your hope. Uh, but I am here tonight to preach that we have a great hope in Jesus. Uh, you see, if he can attack our minds, he can rob us of our experience. He can rob us of our endurance. And ultimately, he can rob us of our hope. And so we must protect our minds we must keep this hope alive we cannot expose our minds to the continual onslaught of the enemy amen we must hold on to our hope with everything we must protect it you see without hope just like in cte those feelings of despair and depression and even suicide all these things that happen without hope we would quit Without hope, we would give up. Without hope, we would stop trying. Without hope, we would just walk away. And see, that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to give up. He wants you to quit trying. He wants you to just stop to quit and to throw your hands up in the air and turn your back and just walk away. But I'm telling you, we got a helmet of salvation. <laughs> we got a more sure word of prophecy, the Scripture says. <laughs> We have a hope in Jesus that is eternal. In fact, uh, the writer of Hebrews said, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. See, it's, it's a helmet of salvation. It protects your thinking because it, it inspires hope within you. And that hope then becomes an anchor for your soul to keep you centered, to keep you focused, uh, to keep you locked in to the goal and to the prize. And so the enemy is after your hope. I'm almost done. Another half hour or so. So this is what happens when I have time to study. <laughs> I found this illustration in reading today and thought I would share it with you. It's a great illustration uh, about our hope and how it relates to the helmet of salvation. It's about a woman by the name of Florence Chadwick. Anybody ever heard of a woman named Florence Chadwick? Actually, most of you probably have. You just have forgotten because it's a long time ago. Florence Chadwick was the first woman to swim the English Channel. And in 1952, she uh, was swimming from Catalina Island all the way to the you know, main shore of California. Several miles. doesn't say how many miles, but it was several miles. It was a long swim. And no one had ever done that before. She had the ability to do it. She had the strength to do it. She had the endurance to do it. She demonstrated that when she had swum the English Channel. She had swum that channel twice. But the day came for her to swim from Catalina Island to the coast of California. And on that day, there was a terrible fog that rolled in. And she could not see in front of her. 
That lady stayed in the water swimming. I don't understand how. Stayed in the water swimming for 15 hours. There were boats that were around her. There were people there you know, close enough so that if she got in trouble, they could help her and rescue her. Right? But the fog was so thick, literally, she could just see hardly anything in front of her. And those that were in the boats you know, to help her rescue her if she got in trouble, they were trying to cheer her on, trying to encourage her to keep going, keep going, keep going. But she couldn't. She couldn't see because of the fog. Fifteen hours, she was tired. She was weary. And after 15 hours, even though there were people saying, come on, you can do it. After 15 hours, she gave up. And they pulled her up into the boat. Only to realize, at that point, now I know this still seems like a long way, but at that point, she was less than half a mile from the shore. Now to me and you, that's a long way. For me to swim to that back wall so long way. <laughs> but she was less than half a mile from the shore. But she said, all I could see was the fog. She said, I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. She lost hope because she couldn't see the shore. Because the fog rolled in. And blinded her vision and she couldn't see clearly. This is what the enemy wants to do to you and to me. See, our salvation is given to us as a great hope. Right? Coming of the Lord. A redeemed body. Sin being defeated and forever and ever. That hope that we have. But the enemy wants to bring in thoughts and doubts. And he wants to cloud our minds so that we can't see the shore. I don't know just how close, John, I don't know just how close heaven's shore is. Spiritually, it might just be a half a mile. And you've been living for the Lord a long time. A lot of the rest of you have been living for the Lord a long time. But I don't want there to be something to cloud my mind at this stage in the game. I've been in the game too long. I've been in the water too long. I've been fighting the fight of faith too long. Right? For something to come and cloud my mind right now and keep me from seeing the shore and cause me to give up. See, without hope, and I'm closing with this, without hope, we are prone to discouragement. Without hope, we are given to despair. Without hope, We give in to depression. This is why we've got to have a helmet of salvation. Because the helmet of salvation is what ignites and inspires and encourages hope within us. Salvation or hope, it protects our understanding. It protects our perspective. And it protects our motives. But see, when you lose hope, your perspective is skewed. Your understanding is diminished. And your motives become questionable. But you know what? I want to ask the Lord, let me put on the helmet of salvation. Lord, protect my mind. Protect my perspective. Protect my understanding. Protect my motives. Protect my thoughts. Let my mind be redeemed and let my mind be renewed. And let my hope rise and soar. Lord, don't let there be any fog that keeps me from seeing the finish line. I want to make it. And I want, to, I want you to make it. And I want us to make it together.
And if we will put on that helmet of salvation. Keep it strapped firmly in place. (laughs) It'll protect your ears. It'll protect your thoughts. It'll protect you. And it'll allow hope to take root in your mind. Instead of despair. Let's stand together tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. There's a song that we've sung at times. I have hope when trouble comes my way. I have hope since Jesus I have, has come to stay. I have hope when things are not well with me. I have hope. It's a beautiful hope that sets me free. Amen. Are you thankful for the helmet of salvation tonight? Can we lift up our hands? Come on. And through just a couple of moments of prayer here, can you fix that helmet of salvation firmly in place on your mind and your heart and your spirit? Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we love you tonight. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you, Lord, for the helmet of salvation, O God. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the hope that is inspired by such a great salvation, Lord Jesus. Uh, God, I thank you, Lord, and I don't want to see that hope diminished, oh God, in anyone, Lord, that's here tonight, anyone that's watching, listening online, oh God, hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Uh, Oh God, I pray that our hope will be ignited, that our hope will be encouraged, that our hope will be firm and steadfast, that our hope will be, God, that anchor, Lord, of the soul, Lord Jesus. Uh, I am asking you, oh Lord, help us to guard our hearts and help us to guard our thoughts and help us to guard uh, our minds tonight. Help us, Lord Jesus, uh, to have firmly fixed and and, and in place, oh God, uh, the helmet, Lord Jesus. Uh, Keep us, God, from discouragement and despair and despondency and depression, God. Help us, Lord Jesus. Uh, Oh, God, I pray that your spirit would come and you would blow the fog away, uh, Lord, from anyone's mind that keeps them, God, from seeing the finish line and seeing the shore. I pray, oh, God, that you, Lord, would have your way, oh, God. Uh, Oh, hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Uh, Oh, Lord, we love you tonight. We praise you, God. We worship you and we lift up your glory great name tonight oh god hallelujah jesus hallelujah jesus hallelujah jesus oh praise god praise god praise god praise god amen just once again can we lift our voices in thanksgiving amen and just thank the lord for his word tonight hallelujah lord i thank you for your word god i want to apply it to my heart and to my life and to my spirit god Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, tonight. Let your people be strengthened. Let your people be helped. Uh, Let your people, God, be encouraged. Uh, Let your people be ministered unto. Let your people be blessed tonight. Oh, hallelujah, by the Word of God. Lord, we thank you and praise you, oh God, today. Lord, in the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you for being here. Amen. Strap on that helmet.